Water. Earth. Fire. Air. Long ago, the four nations lived together in harmony. Then, everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. As you probably well know, Revenge and Rebirth put the Naruto card game and, by proxy, Bandai Namco in a very difficult position. The game was in a state that essentially revolved around a single strategy, and every time they tried to release something to counter it, it just sort of absorbed it and became even more powerful. So, could they do it? Could Bandai Namco somehow release a set that puts the game back on course and brings some freshness to the metagame? Um, somehow, against all odds, yes, I think they did. Dream Legacy was a ginormous Hail Mary for the company, because they essentially threw all of their ideas into a single set and tried to make it work. This included gems like the Akatsuki, Sand, Sanin, Snow, Rasengan, and Kaijus. The set was so big, in fact, that they had to split it into two sets. That's why there's a lot of bleed between sets 5 and 6, because it was originally one set that had to be split into two. This isn't necessarily confirmed, but I have a lot of reasons to believe this was the case. The strongest factor being this card right here. Black Dragon Blizzard is a Doto only- Doto was this guy from the first Naruto movie, by the way, in case you were lost. Black Dragon Blizzard was a Doto only jutsu released for the set. Yet suspiciously, there was no Doto ninja card released for set 5. Doto didn't come until set 6. The only conclusion I can draw from this is the fact that they were part of the same set at some point, but then, during a split, they accidentally forgot to put Dodo in this set. If it were the other way around and we got Dodo but not the Jutsu, you could just call the Jutsu support, but because it happened this way, I'm not really buying it. Now I'm not gonna sit here and try and act upset that I didn't get a Dodo card. I don't even remotely like Dodo. But what if I did? What if I saw the first Naruto movie and thought Doto was the coolest ninja I'd ever seen? I keep pulling jutsu after jutsu and I'm so excited to build that Doto deck I've always dreamed of, but he never comes. Why, Bondi probably broke some little kid's tiny little Doto loving heart. But alas, we will attempt to forgive them and move on. The first of these new toys I'd like to look at is the Rasengan. After seeing what they did with Chidori, I was very excited to see how they could rival the power of Chidori with Rasengan. Considering between the two, I do think it is a little bit cooler, and I'm excited to see Lightning actually get something competitive. First, we'll look at the support around Rasengan, and then we'll get to the main attraction. Shu was a client that made all of Naruto's Rasengans cost one Lightning. This was pretty interesting for a few reasons. One being that it meant you weren't limited to which Naruto could actually use the benefits of having a cheaper Rasengan. It's not like Sasuke where you have to only use one Sasuke if you want to be competitive with your Chidori, you can use this with any Naruto you want. It wasn't quite as good as having a free Jutsu, mind you, but it was good enough that I think this is one of the better support cards. It also wasn't a can ability, so technically your Naruto could use multiple Rasengans and still get the same benefit during the same turn. Mastering a Secret Technique Naruto was the first Naruto card released with Rasengan in mind. If Naruto's injured and goes out to battle and is opposed, then you can flip a coin and if it's heads, you can put a Rasengan from your chakra or your discard back into your hand. Meaning you were guaranteed to have one for the battle to come. Obviously, 50-50 shot makes us not great. Made this card really difficult to stomach, but I mean, if as long as Rasengan is a good card, I think this is a great way to introduce it without it being too busted. Another neat thing they were able to do with Naruto is, in order to keep Rasengan from getting as busted as Chidori, they made one of the requirements be that Naruto has clone status, so if they wanted to release a Naruto with a great effect, but not want to make him overpowered and give him Rasengan as well, then they could just not give that Naruto clone status. Not the best, but I am excited to see the Rasengan card that this is all leading up to. Oh my gosh, I am just so excited right now. Are you ready, guys? Rasengan! Let's bust this bad boy down piece by piece. Usable by Naruto with clone status, the fourth Hokage, and of course, Jiraiya. The target gets plus seven plus zero during this turn. Ah, oh, Naruto, my beautiful baby boy, what a great way to start off a jutsu. 
This makes most injured Naruto's a 10, which is, oof, that is pretty beefy. At the end of the turn, give one damage to every ninja in this ninja's team. <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry. What? For a plus seven that isn't even free? Why? I understand learning from your mistakes and trying not to overtune something as soon as it comes out, but this card makes this strategy literally unplayable. <laughs> so you can't team Naruto up with anybody or else he's gonna kill them all. It is literally impossible to spam this jutsu because Naruto is going to die the first or second time he uses it. And I don't even want to think about trying to make this work with Jiraiya and the fourth Hokage who have to pay three to even make this jutsu work. Some of you out there might be trying to justify this by pointing out that Naruto is more powerful when he's injured, so you could send out a healthy Naruto and have him use Rasengan to get the plus three power boost he gets from being injured. But if that's really the strategy we were trying to go for, then I ask you, why wouldn't it just injure him immediately? Why would it wait until the end of the turn? Because you're not even going to get the power boost until after the turn is already over, so you're not even getting it for this battle. It's irredeemable. You can't, you can't play it. It's, it's gone. <laughs> my boy. My boy. Look how they massacred my boy. While we're down here in the lower rungs of the set, we might as well take a look at what they tried to do with snow. The cool thing about the snow cards is they didn't restrict them specifically to the snow ninja, which is both good and bad. It's good because that means if they're good cards, you can use them in any strategy you want. But it's bad because since it's so generic, they had to make the restrictions a little bit too constricting. Tsubame Snowstorm gave a ninja plus two plus zero for one water and one non-specific. This effect was boosted by plus one for every copy of this in your discard pile. Believe it or not, this is actually really close to being a good usable card. Honestly, what's killing this is the fact that it has a cost of two. Cross-shaped shuriken is two generics, and you get the plus three plus zero without having to have anything specific in your discard pile, meaning that just having three of these is way better than having any Tsubames. Even Kunai has it beat, because even though it doesn't give a plus one for every copy of Kunai you have in your discard pile, you can get plus two plus two on one of your backline ninjas so that your frontline ninjas aren't the ones casting all the jutsu, plus it only costs one instead of two. They played it a little bit too safe with this card. If they had gone all out and just made it a one cost jutsu, even if it was one water specific chakra jutsu, it actually would have been pretty good because you were getting the benefits of kunai with the downside that a backline ninja couldn't use it, but with the plus side of you getting a potential plus four plus zero. Unlike Wolfang Avalanche, which is actually just garbage in every single sense of the word. Now I'm not gonna sit here and mock mill strategies because I think milling a deck is a very legitimate way of winning a match and having as a deck style, but I do think that this is an awful card. First of all, it's a double X cost, which means you have to keep the two numbers the same or it doesn't go off. And your opponent essentially discards half of whatever you paid for the jutsu. So if you were to pay 10 chakra, for example, your opponent would discard the top five cards of their deck. This sounds slightly appealing in an era where we still have the Naruto cop rolling around, discarding cards off the top of the deck, and every once in a while you will hit something important, but it's just so much. And what's really, really holding it back, cherry on top of the cake, is the fact that you can only use water to pay for this card. Just not good. It doesn't even go with the ice style strategy, so I don't even know why it exists. White Whale is fascinatingly somehow the best of these three cards. Basically, after you play it, uh, everybody skips the showdown phase. So it's a pretty neat way to stall out your opponent because if you skip the showdown phase, nobody gets any battle rewards as well as the actual battle itself not happening. So you could hypothetically just send out one ninja have them use White Whale, and then just end the turn, essentially, because there's no battle going to be going down, and no teams are going to be defeated, nothing's going to happen. It essentially just cancels out one of your opponent's turns. It's hard to say whether or not three is really worth it in this case. Um, on the one hand, it is a very, very life-saving card, but 
On the other hand, if you are in a position where you have to use White Whale, it's probably not actually going to do that much for you because you're in a pretty awful position. But there are some cases where I could see teching one or two of these into a deck, so I mean, if that's what you want to do, then go for it. Awkwardly, Sakura herself also sort of got a Jujutsu in the Ice line, uh, Sakura Blizzard Jutsu, which is pretty hilarious. They were, oh man, they were trying their absolute hardest to give Sakura something to do. But believe it or not, um, it's actually kind of really good, so let's take a look. Basically, Sakura gets plus zero plus X, X being the number of Jutsus you have in your discard pile, for one Chakra. And this is actually really fantastic. It's really a hallmark to just how good it can be to make a Jutsu specific to a ninja so that you can make its effect actually do something. See, if you were only paying one for Subame, it would have been a much better Jutsu. If you were only paying one line of Chakra for Wolf Style, it would have been a better Jutsu. And of course, if you lowered the cost of White Whale a bit, it would have been a better Jutsu. And you could have done all of this by just making them specific to Ice Ninjas. At this time, people are running about 10 to 12 Jutsus in their deck, so you could actually hit some pretty high numbers with this. And even if you were only getting, like, two that's still paying one chakra for a boost of two in the back row, which is pretty decent. And, you know, I guess since we're here, we'll go ahead and look at Black Dragon Blizzard, you know, for that Doto fan out there. Love you, kid. Keep holding it down. So one water and X, and you can give one damage to one ninja with an entrance cost of X or less. This is a pretty good card, and again, they could make it a good card because it was Doto exclusive. You just pay one chakra to straight out injure a turn zero ninja, and the cool thing about that is most turn zero ninjas, if you're playing them, have some kind of good effect that isn't valid. So you can invalidate somebody's effect for the cost of one chakra. Pretty good. You could even pay two chakra to have this happen to Sasuke, in which case Sasuke is no longer valid, so his effect doesn't work, so you can start beating him. Over and all, it's actually really good. <clears throat> Minus the fact that you have to use Doto, who hasn't been released. Anyways, getting out of memes for a second and getting onto some actual legitimate strategies, let's talk about the Sane next. Of course, this Jiraiya was released in set 3, not set 5, but I do want to bring him up because Jiraiya really didn't get any love in this set. No good Jiraiya cards came out, even though good versions of Orochimaru and Tsunade came out, which is a bit of a shame, but at the same time, I think it's because Jiraiya already had such good cards, they wanted to put some focus on the other two. The first legitimate Orochimaru came out in this set, which got a lot of people excited, because up to this point the only Orochimaru we had was that incredibly cheesy turn 3 Orochimaru. He came out of the gate swinging, he was pretty good stat-wise as far as the Sonning go. He was 6-4, so he was excellent as a support ninja, and even if he got injured, he was a 5-3, so he was still an excellent support ninja. In fact, he's the only one of the Sonning that can be a good support ninja. He had 3 mental power, and his effect was... eh, it was pretty okay. When he comes into play, he gives your opponent a choice. They can draw one card and give you a battle reward, or they can let you discard two cards from their hand. What makes this pretty delicious is honestly, your opponent would be so excited about getting to draw one card that giving you one battle reward doesn't really seem like that big of a deal, but later on in the game, when your opponent is sitting at seven battle rewards lost and they have to choose between letting you discard two of the key cards from their hand at random or giving you an eighth battle reward and putting you in a game-winning position, Watching your opponent sweat over little things like that is just, mwah, delicious. Of course, competitively, it's not necessarily the most viable strategy. Um, anything that gives your opponent a choice is pretty bad to begin with, but also, if your opponent just plays out their hand, uh, they could just tell you to discard two cards from their hand, even if they have zero cards in their hand to actually discard. But still, I think it's a pretty good way to just exemplify Orochimaru as a character by using a card. Tsunade, on the other hand, actually was released with a little bit of support. Shizune has one mental power. She's a turn three with three three stats, which makes her absolutely amazing. Basically like having a Kurenai one turn earlier. And her effect negated the effect of your in-play Tsunade card, which might confuse you for now, but you'll understand when we actually look at the Tsunades as to why this is actually pretty awesome. 
Tauntaun is a turn 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 that cannot use jutsu cards, which is a little bit depressing because I think it'd be pretty hilarious to cast spells from your Tauntaun, but that's okay. Little piggy kunais and shurikens and dragon fire jutsus. And as long as you have them in play, on the turn that you play a Shizune or a Tsunade, you can uh, deploy one additional ninja for the turn. And again, this is a can effect, so you can't do something like Tsunade into Shizune into a third ninja. You do have to do them separately. Regardless, though, deploying ninjas is more valuable than gold in this game, so it's still a decent effect. Tsunade got not one, but two secret rares in this set. Tsunade is a 9 power on the turn she comes into play, and she has 3 mental power. Her problem being that if you have 2 other injured ninjas in play, she becomes a 6. That's not great. And since her other stats kinda suck a whole lot, she can't actually be used as a back row ninja. You have to have her in the front, and having a 6 is not necessarily the greatest. Of course, this can be fixed by just meat puppeting off your ninjas or finding a deck that can heal your ninjas, but honestly, it's just kind of okay. Of course, if you have a Shizune in play, this effect isn't worth worrying about. Legendary Sitting Duck was a slightly more popular Tsunade because its effect was essentially when your opponent flips a coin, they can just choose to take heads as their result instead of flipping. So. Eh, I mean, people didn't really use coin flip abilities, that's what made her so good. And if your opponent just so happened to know that you were running this, then they could hypothetically start running coin flips, but what are the odds that your opponent is going to just run coin flips for this one ninja? It's probably not going to happen, so it essentially doesn't have an effect. This Tsunade stands on her own without needing Shizune, and uh, that makes her... Just fine, but again, if you did need to, you could play Shizune to negate her effect. The logical question at this stage is, which of the two Tsunades was actually better? Like, if I were going to build a Tsunade deck, which Tsunade would I actually use? Well, well, I can certainly see the goods and the bads in both Tsunades, and uh, it is a little bit of a close competition between the two. The correct answer is actually neither. In a kind of bizarre move. Bondi invalidated both Tsunades by releasing a Tsunade Shizune platoon, which was infinitely, infinitely better than both of the other Tsunades. She still has the 8 combat, so she's still great in the front. She has 4 support, so she can be useful in the back. You can play her off of a Shizune, which you were already gonna run anyways, so honestly, it was better to just run Shizune and then platoon it into Tsunade and Shizune on turn 6. It doesn't even take up your deploy, so honestly, there's just no downside to doing this instead of running a Tsunade. Oh sure, if you wanted, you could definitely run a Tsunade alongside this, but if you were going to use Tsunade in your deck at all, you were always going to rely on the Tsunade and Shizune because it was just always the better option. It even has an actual, non-negative effect. When she's put in play, draw two cards, and at the end of your turn, move two cards from your hand to the bottom of the deck. So basically, you play her, you draw two cards, and then you either charge them as chakra, you play them if they're jutsu, you play them if they're missions, or if they're ninjas, you just kind of sit on them. Or you can play one because you still have your deploy. Or if you really didn't want to charge anything, you could just put them on the bottom of your deck. Really, it wasn't that big of a deal. Some of the jutsu support was also pretty interesting. Uh, Tsunade definitely got it the best in this area. A tap on the forehead lets you change one Genin battling against you to injured status. At this point in the game, this isn't necessarily that useful. I mean, you could injure a Shikamaru to get rid of its effect. You could injure a uh, Sasuke, of course. Most Sasukes are garbage when they're injured. So you could easily put a couple of these in the sideboard, but I don't think anybody actually mainboarded it. Tasteless and Odorless Drug was, in my personal opinion, one of the most underrated cards in the entire set. For two Chakra, you could put one coin on a standby ninja, and that ninja's just useless for the rest of the battle. It cannot be sent out to battle. Tsunade's got some pretty beefy stats, so at some point, you're going to attack with Tsunade and your opponent's going to send out something useless to defend against you, and then you'll just be able to Tasteless, Odorless Drug, their best card. Brokage, gone. Kakashi, gone. Sasuke, gone. Whatever they have, 
it's gone, and there's really no easy way to get rid of a poison counter at this stage. My Totic Regeneration lets you heal your Tsunade, and then this bounces right back to your hand, so you could essentially just heal every single turn so she never died. Or you could easily just heal her, then bounce it back to your hand, and then use it as a cost for a mission card or another ninja. Jiraiya got Toad Mouth Trap, which saw a lot more play than you would expect. It's a Jiraiya-only jutsu that targets every ninja and one of the teams being sent out, so it doesn't have to be the team battling against you, it could be one of the other teams, potentially a team that wasn't blocked. You flip a coin for every ninja in the team, and if it's heads, then they go to the top of the deck, so it's essentially like being able to use multiple 8 trigrams at the same time. Again, not great, but if your opponent happened to use Legendary Sitting Duck Tsunade or something, it could be a little bit better. Of course they wouldn't because of the platoon, but you know what I mean. It was a Jiraiya thing, if you wanted to use it, it definitely wasn't the worst thing out there. While we're on the subject of Sonning, let's talk about Kaijus, because this is really where it got started. By Kaijus, I mean Tailed Beasts, Summonings, pretty much anything that's big and has really huge stats, but has some kind of specific condition to actually getting out. This set was a representation of the three-cornered deadlock between the three Sonin, and thus it had all of the summonings, and it was pretty awesome. Probably my favorite part of the set, if we're really being honest. Gamma Bunta got a turn 7, 9, 1, and his special effect was he could only be summoned if you have Jiraiya on the field, which was a little bit disappointing because it took away the idea of having Naruto use the summoning jutsu, but nonetheless, it was Jiraiya's moment to shine, so I guess it makes sense that Naruto can't use it, and you're probably going to be using Naruto regardless. His other effect is that if your opponent has a snake or a slug in play, then he actually has an entrance cost of zero, meaning he can come out as soon as your opponent plays their summoning. Katsuyu was a turn 7, you could only play her if you have Tsunade in play, pretty standard. Its other effect is if it's discarded due to damage, it returns to the hand instead of being discarded, which honestly made it, hands down, the best of the three summonings. It's 0-4 in injured status, so you could easily puppet it out to take some damage for you, and if it does end up dying, it just goes back to the hand to be played again. Manda was a little bit more rough, despite being the summoning that I actually played. He's a turn 8 instead of uh, turn 7, which might sound like a downside, but he also doesn't need Orochimaru to be in play in order for him to be played. It's just, if you don't have a Rachimaru in play, he literally eats one of your ninjas every single turn. So, if you don't have a Rochimaru in play, he can still be played, but if you do have a Rochimaru in play, then he's just a really big, beefy 9-0. Speaking of which, you might remember me saying that you should keep that turn 3 Rochimaru in mind during the second video, and uh, if you did, congratulations, because here's where it pays off. Each of the three summonings has some kind of summoning jutsu that's exclusive to them and their line. Manda actually got his summoning jutsu back in set 2, before he was even a thing because there was a giant snake released in the set. The requirements are pretty non-specific, it just takes any Jonin to summon him. And of course it doesn't really matter what your turn counter is if you're using summoning jutsu to bring Manda out. Would have been very fair and interesting indeed had this Orochimaru not been released. Yeah, starting here, this card starts to create a lot of problems within the game, because it is a Sanin rank. Basically, the idea is you can play this Orochimaru on turn 3, have him attack, and then play Summoning Jutsu to play Manda on turn 3. Since Manda doesn't need anything specific to be out on the field, you can essentially just have a 9-0 on turn 3 and stomp your opponent. With Manda and Orochimaru in the same team, you've got a team of 13, and that's not even including the fact that you can have Orochimaru in a full team of three ninjas when you play the summoning jutsu. So you've just got this huge, massive team your opponent can't do anything about, and then you can use Manda to steamroll. Your instincts are probably telling you, but wait, that's a horrible idea. Manda eats one of your ninjas every turn that Orochimaru isn't in play. But you see, it doesn't really matter, 
Monda can very easily step over teams by himself this early in the game, so honestly he's either two guaranteed battle rewards every turn or guaranteed killing one ninja every turn, so it really doesn't matter if you have to sacrifice a ninja every turn. Gamabunta summoning jutsu had of course already been released as well. What made Gamabunta summoning jutsu interesting is the fact that there were things outside of Gamabunta that you could summon, so if you did happen to already have Gamabunta on the field and need to summon something else, you definitely could. In fact, in this set alone, we saw not one, but two new toads. Ninja Toad was a turn for 5040, so his stats weren't super bad, and if he was ever discarded, you could put him on the bottom of the deck. Gamatatsu lowered the entrance cost of all of your Ninja Toads by one, so you could bring out your Gamabuntas and your Ninja Toads a lot earlier. Honestly, there were so many good Toads out at this point that you could easily just build a Toad deck, and it would probably be the best of the three summoning decks. The summonings also got their own mission in the form of Three Cornered Deadlock, which let each player search their deck for a snake, a toad, or a slug. So if your opponent wasn't running a deck that revolved around summoning, then essentially you got something for free and they didn't. Some people were teching in like a random Gamma or Gamma Kichi just to make sure that they got summoning off of Three Cornered Deadlock, but that was pretty rare. Finally, we should probably talk about their non-summoning jutsu support. First of which being Jiraiya and Gamabunta's Toad Flame Bombs. Basically, it's a jutsu that Jiraiya used, but you couldn't actually activate it unless Gamabunta's in the same team. And if they are, then it gives two damage to every ninja badly against the user. Basically, it wipes the entire team that was fighting against you. Obviously, this card is pretty sweet. The only downside to it is it's kind of expensive at three, and it's a little bit finicky to set up because your opponent could very, very easily just get rid of Gamabunta from the team to make this card worthless. Those are nitpicks, though, in comparison to what you get. Gamabunta plus Jiraiya means your opponent's strongest team is taken directly to the discard pile. Katsuyu and Manda got lesser versions of this in Acid Slime and Coiling Around, which essentially just costs two specific chakra, and you could take one ninja and put them in the discard pile. Well, it gave two damage, but it was essentially the same as putting them in the discard pile. The great thing about these, though, is you don't need to have Tsunade and Orochimaru in play in order to use them, and it can be any ninja on the field, so you don't actually have to give the two damage to the ninja you're battling. You could give it to a standby ninja, or you can give it to a ninja from one of the other teams. Less impactful, but more versatile. The set came out around the time that Itachi had just made his first appearance, so obviously the Akatsuki were the most hype thing in the set. Whether or not they lived up to that hype, though, eh, let's take a look. Of course, if we're going to start talking about the Akatsuki cards, there's no other place to begin than with Itachi, who got himself one of the prettiest looking ninja cards in the entire game thus far. Like, god dang, Itachi. I ain't gay or nothing, but you looking like a snack and I'm hungry. The big fear with Itachi's release was, of course, that they're finally giving stuff to the other sets to make them more competitive, and if they release Itachi and he's extremely good, then it's going to keep fire on its pedestal and just continue to give it even more power. And I am happy to report that, yeah, yeah, that's basically what happened, yep. True heir to the Sharingan Itachi's effect is if your opponent does not have a Sharingan Eye Ninja in play, then he can't receive damage during the showdown. So basically, he was a blocker that could be used unlimited times as long as your opponent didn't have Sasuke, Kakashi, or Itachi in play. On the one hand, it's pretty unlikely your opponent's not playing with a Sasuke or a Kakashi in their deck since they're such good cards, but on the other hand, if your opponent is trying to move away from Sasuke and Kakashi and they don't have an Itachi, they basically can't win. Because unless there's some way to negate Itachi's effect or injure him because his effect isn't valid, there's really no way to step over him. This made him potentially a game-winning card, but just not a very consistent one. As good as this Itachi is, and I completely understand why people were so excited to get their hands on this card at the time, looking back with a bit of perspective, I do think it's safe to say that this card wasn't necessarily as game-breaking as people let on that it was. 
Like, sure, he can't take damage from the showdown, but it also doesn't do anything to win you the game, necessarily. It's just really hard to step over. Eventually, you're gonna play a Sasuke or Kakashi, and if you don't have them in your deck, then it can still be 8 Trigrams, they can still be removed from the field, or injured with a Jutsu card, or any number of ways to deal with it. It's just... You know, in the situations where it's good, it's understandably good, but... In a lot of cases, if you're playing the game in a competitive way, you're gonna have some way to get around it. Kisame was released alongside Itachi, and despite not getting anywhere near as much love, in my personal opinion, I think Kisame was actually a little bit better. When he sent out to attack, at the end of the turn you discard two of your opponent's chakras, which puts their chakra supply in limited order, and this late in the game, that means they're going to miss out on casting a lot of jutsu. It is a teeny tiny bit slow because it doesn't get rid of any chakra immediately, it only happens at the end of the turn, but the effect is valid, so... I mean, honestly, it's a great way to keep your opponent in check and keep them from doing any huge game-winning moves. It's anti-setup. Your opponent cannot possibly do anything to make a big move against you if their chakra is continuously draining. Then again, as a mono-water player, I could be a bit biased. I accept that. When it comes to Jutsu support, as you can probably imagine, Kisame didn't get a whole lot, but uh, Itachi got a bunch. The only Kisame Jutsu we got was Shark Skin, which was pay to discard the top three cards of your opponent's deck. Once again, I'm not going to knock mill strategies, but uh, it's a little bit weak. You could hypothetically run three of these if you really, really, really want to pull off like a Kisame win strategy sort of thing, and then discard nine cards off the top of your opponent's deck for six chakra. And again, that is a totally valid way to win the game, but eh, it's just, it's not great. It definitely wasn't in the meta. Itachi got the Kaleidoscope Sharingan, which is a really funny name because you can tell that this is what the translators were given before they knew that they were just going to keep the name Mangekyo. Uh, by the way, if you don't happen to know, Mangekyo is literally Japanese for Kaleidoscope, so it's kind of meta. Just not necessarily the meta we're looking for. Costs 2, subtracts 2 power from each ninja facing against Itachi. It's decent. 2 for a potential minus 6 is definitely okay. The infamous Sukuyomi also makes an appearance. Target one ninja on the field. Put that ninja on top of the deck and then search your opponent's hand for any other ninjas with the same name and also put them on top of the deck. So it's 8 trigrams with a slightly, slightly better effect. In that same vein, Amaterasu was essentially the same thing, but with Jutsus. You could negate and discard a Jutsu and then look through your opponent's hand for any Jutsu with the same name and discard them as well. Obviously, what made this so powerful wasn't necessarily that you were just negating and getting rid of a Jutsu. That is good, but it's not the best. Getting to look through your opponent's hand for two Chakra is pretty good. And if you do happen to get rid of any other copies of the Jutsu, then that's just a bonus especially if your opponent's trying to do something like stack Chijori. Sylvan Fetters was released too, and it's not an Itachi-only Jutsu, but it's a Genjutsu user-only Jutsu, and I mean, come on, if you're gonna go with a Genjutsu user, you're probably gonna choose Itachi. Its effect is for one chakra, you can choose a ninja with an entrance cost lower than the user, and flip a coin if it's heads, that ninja's gone. Obviously, coin flips, not something you want to rely on, but for one chakra, potentially getting rid of a ninja is actually pretty worth it. Believe it or not, if you were running a Fire Wind deck, you would see two or three of these floating around sometimes. The last real support they got was in the form of a mission card called Mysterious Small Organization. Every Akatsuki ninja in your hand gets minus one entrance cost. This card might seem very simple on the offset, but there's a card that we'll talk about a bit later that actually makes this a bit more complicated and a bit more powerful than I think they intended. Alongside the Akatsuki, they released a Kakashi that was very, very powerful for the time. If your opponent has any Akatsuki ninjas in play, you can put this card in play during your opponent's turn for free in any of your teams, even if that team already has three ninja in it. I wouldn't necessarily argue that this Kakashi is better than any Kakashi we already have, and it is a bit situational, but a lot of people were putting it in their sideboard just in case they faced a full-on Akatsuki deck. After talking about all of these big names, you'd think we'd run out of stuff to talk about, but no, the generic support released for the set was pretty good too, and we have to look at it. 
This Naruto is potentially the most iconic card released in the entire set, and potentially the entire game. It's definitely one of the most recognizable. Its effect is very simple too. When you put it in play, you draw a card, and because it has a growth, you can growth it in play and draw another card. The downside of the card being, if your opponent just so happens to be running an Akatsuki deck, then all of their Akatsuki ninjas get minus one entrance cost. So this plus Mysterious Organization meant that your opponents could legitimately be getting all their Akatsuki ninjas out on turn 4, which is bad. But despite that, this Naruto saw play pretty much every single set from now on. When you think about it though, it is strange that in the last set we saw such a powerful Naruto in Cop, and people were still trying to police the field with their Cop Narutos. But they very quickly became the minority. Why? I think it's because despite the huge potential that this Naruto had, it just wasn't very well built to sustain the current meta. Sure, he could be a pretty big beefy 6-0 when he's injured, but that's not going to do anything against Chidori, or mental power, or straight up damage, or pretty much anything else that was running around at this time. And everybody understood you were only going to pump him up to a 6, like, once during a game, because you didn't want to be milling yourself out of the game. Contrast this with the potentially plus 3 card draws you get off of Naruto Legacy of the 4th Okage, and it becomes kind of more complicated. Sure, he didn't have any direct advantages on the board, but the fact that you could draw an extra 2 cards if you growthed him was just a lot more useful than having Cop Naruto. The cards you drew could be used to pay for mission cards, they could be charged to the chakra, they could be the next ninja that you're going to play during your next turn. It just translates so much better into advantage than just having a bigger, beefier ninja in play does. This is kind of one of the things that I love about the Naruto card game, is they didn't just power creep out the other Naruto by making a Naruto with potentially more power, they just released a Naruto that gives you advantage in a different way, and people saw that that advantage was actually pretty good. Bandai had this down pat with the Naruto CCG, and there are card games today that still aren't learning this very effectively. When you release new stuff to replace the old stuff, you don't just have to keep making the numbers bigger so everybody has to run the new stuff. You just make people think differently, increase their importance on practicality over having actual field advantage. Give cards more depth, not more numbers. Might Guy was released as a counter to Itachi and Kakashi, which is very interesting, because if you had him fight against Kakashi or Itachi, he would be exactly one power higher than them. The one support is kind of useless though. I do wish they had made him just a plus two plus zero instead of a plus one plus one, but beggars can't be choosers. Research Tour became a really common card in Lightning decks because it let you look at the top three cards of your deck and then choose to put them on the bottom or put them back on top. Questionably though, you were going minus two in order to do this, and since you didn't actually get to draw any of the cards, eh, it just kind of showed how desperate Lightning was for some sort of consistency. No interest is a counter counter, which is just always going to be endlessly funny to me. You play a mission card, then your opponent plays some kind of counter mission card, and then you play a counter counter mission card to counter their counter mission card. This was basically only used against Caged Bird. Playing Catch was an interesting let your opponent choose an effect sort of thing. Either you get to draw one card, or both players get to draw two cards. The idea being that since it's your turn, you can do more with those two cards than your opponent can. This might seem like a pretty meaningless card here on the surface, but let me assure you, this card saw play. The last lightning mission we'll look at is Focus. I personally loved this card, though it didn't see as much play as I would have liked during the time that it came out. Its effect is that you can only use one jutsu during your turn, but if that jutsu is applied successfully, then you get to get three cards from your discard pile back into your chakra area. So if you were using Free Dory, for example, then you just got three free cards into your chakra area. Or if you were using something like Rasengan, you could pretty much just use it for its three cost and then not have to have paid anything at the end of the turn. It wasn't the most meta card at the time, but it had a lot of applications and it had the potential to be used in many different decks. 
my guy ended up getting a couple of very interesting jutsu. Uh, in particular, this, Severe Leaf Hurricane, gave him plus 5, plus 0 for one chakra, which is terrifying. And Dynamic Entry, which made him mobile. You could essentially use Dynamic Entry to move Might Guy in between your teams, or if for some reason him being out would put him in danger, you could use Dynamic Entry to put him in one of your non-battling teams to save him. I think somebody at Bondi really wanted the idea of, like, Might Guy carrying to be a thing, so they just gave him a bunch of support to see if it would stick. It didn't, but it was still really funny. We might as well get fire out of the way. Sasuke got a childhood card, even though it wasn't called childhood at the time. Bondi was still really new to this idea of having some ninjas be a lower entrance cost or be uh, smaller stat-wise by having some kind of childhood or earlier form of the ninja released, but they just they didn't know what to do with it at the time, so they didn't think to give it a different name so that it could be used in conjunction with regular Sasuke. But the entire point of this card is, if you have it in play and then you growth into a different Sasuke, your Itachi can come out two turns earlier. There was this really, really, really cheesy strategy you could do that essentially got Itachi out on like turn three. If you played this Konohamaru, you could ramp Itachi out on turn three, and that's not even including the bonus you might get from your opponent running Legacy of the Fourth Hokage Naruto, which would potentially ramp him out turn two. Horribly, horribly unreliable strategy. But was it funny? Yes. Yes, it was funny. And yes, it did work. Nawaki was also released as a draw engine alongside Naruto Legacy of the Fourth Okage, and some people ran them in conjunction with each other to just immediately boost their hand size. His gimmick is when he comes into play, you draw a card, and then at the end of the turn, you kill him off and draw a second card. This card had some interesting applications. You could essentially just play it to let your opponent know that you weren't going to challenge them the first couple of turns of the game, but then trade that off for a much, much more consistent mid-game. And as important as I say deploying a ninja every turn is, missing your very first drop isn't immediately going to take you out of the game. There are ways to play around it. Plus, one of the problems with playing turn zeros is... Later on in the game, turn 6, 7, 8, you normally don't want to be seeing them anymore because they slow you down a lot. Their only real use is being meat puppeted off. And with Nawaki, even if you saw him later in the game, it was completely fine. You could play him, get the card draw, and then use the card draw to do some other kind of play. And then once you lost Nawaki, you weren't really shedding a tear over him. Dan was a bit more controversial, because he was exactly the same, except he only got discarded on turns that he was opposed, and this is turn 4, where it's a lot, it's a lot worse to give up a turn 4 than it is to give up a turn 1. Nonetheless, Dan did see some play. The fact that he didn't actually discard himself unless he was opposed meant that it got your opponent to give up one of their meat puppets to just be injured against him so that you could get him off of the field, and once he was gone, you got to draw a card off of him. Pretty much nobody ran this card in conjunction with Nawaki, but a lot of decks were playing around with the idea of having either one or the other. And if you didn't have a consistent mid-game to transition into your late game with, playing Den actually wasn't that bad of an idea, because he was also a card that you could block with, and at the end of the turn that he blocked, you could just draw a card and then draw a card at the beginning of your turn to just be drawn all kinds of cards. Big Brother was an anti-mission card that would essentially let you get rid of a permanent in-play mission card. This was great for getting rid of caged birds, appearance of unknown arrivals, pretty much anything that stayed in play and caused you some sort of grief. No combat stats. There was a use that he had outside of being a combative ninja. Um, but there's really no reason to even talk about it. There was a mission card you could play alongside Big Brother to make him more useful, but it's, it's not even really worth talking about. You would throw two of these in your sideboard just in case your opponent was spamming permanent mission cards. That's it. Catch Out was a card you could only get in starter decks that flat out got rid of a mission card being played. Unfortunately, it's a counter mission card, so you can only use it during your opponent's turn. Can't use it to get rid of a caged bird, but you can use it to get rid of pretty much anything else. A-ranked mission being something that comes to mind, exhaustion of stamina being another. 
Earth got its hands on the Leaf Elders. Homura Mitomon gave all of your ninjas plus one plus zero if they were Leaf Ninjas. Koharu Utatane gave all of your Leaf Ninjas plus one support, which made her more useful, honestly, overall, because each of your ninja teams had two support ninjas and one combat ninja. And together they have four mental power, which if mental power is how you're gonna go, then they're okay. The only problem I have with them is there's a huge disconnect between their effect and their actual stats. Neither of them have any combat stats whatsoever. Turn 5, no combat stats, that's already a pretty hard sell. But then having them not give some kind of mental power or something so you could actually use them in a mental power deck kind of hurts them a lot. Mitate lets you heal one of your ninjas at the end of the turn if this ninja was sent out to block. A very interesting idea, because if you had him block and the head ninja was injured during the block, then you could essentially have a team that could just block every turn. And his effect is valid, so if your opponent does happen to send out a team of four or less, you could just have Mitate go out, block, and then heal one of your ninjas at the end of the turn, or have him heal himself. Okay, let's be clear about something. Gontetsu is not, was not, and will never be a meta card. He is terrible. His effect makes him unplayable, but his effect is also incredibly interesting. When he's sent out to battle and opposed, your opponent puts one card from their hand on top of their deck. If anybody has played through the Yadagarasu form of Yu-Gi-Oh, competitive Yu-Gi-Oh nonetheless, this is such an interesting concept because when you put your opponent in this position they never draw new cards so they're essentially stuck with whatever they have in their hands to play with. I wish, wish they had done something to make Gontetsu more playable, like given him slightly bigger stats or made him a support ninja or something. And what makes it even worse is when he is defeated or completely defeated, your opponent gets to draw two cards. So, eh, he's he's not he's not good, but gosh darn it, I love him. I love him so much. I'll stand this card until the end of time as my he's not good, but maybe if, like, if you think about it, no, he's not good, but on the other hand, but he is pretty terrible, but, eh. Great Athletic Meet was very simple. Neither player can play any mission cards, and that's it. For two turns, no mission cards. In fact, if you ran three of these in your deck, you could potentially lock out mission cards for six turns of the game, which, for decks that rely on mission cards could be very impactful. The great thing about this is if you drop this, you don't have to worry about caged birds anymore. Just no more caged birds. Of course, you also can't caged bird, which sucks for you because you're playing an earth deck, but I mean, as long as you're not affected by it, I guess that's good. So let's talk about earth for a second. Earth has always had some kind of anti-meta thing come out. Earth Mental was released as a way to counter power decks. Caged Bird was released as a way to counter whatever big ninjas were out at the time, like Brokage and Sasuke. But in set 5, they just went all out with it. They went, okay, Earth is the anti-meta set. That's just what it is. If you want to play anti-meta, you have to play Earth. Like, it makes a lot of sense when you think about it, but you also just kind of don't think about it. Earth is the anti-meta set, and they were not shy about it in this set. Fire Seal is a card that just screws over fire decks. That's it. You would think that maybe they would release something like this for all of the elements, maybe something that gets rid of Wind Chakra or Lightning Chakra, but no. They released a one-cost jutsu for getting rid of all of a fire player's chakra, and that's all it does. Ironically, though, this card also shows the ignorance on Bondi's part, because the entire... the Holy cow, guys. The most popular card being used by fire, the most problematic thing they have, is free! You don't need chakra to play Chidori. 
That's the problem. The problem is the Chidori is free. It's not them having a bunch of chakra so they do a bunch of jutsu. It's the fact that their best jutsu card is free and can be used on turns 1 and 2. Groundfisher tried to remedy this a little bit by getting rid of a jutsu card being used by a genin. This card was specifically released to get rid of Chidori. Let's not beat around the bush. This is a negate Chidori card. And just in case kaiju start becoming a problem, Earth Style Dark Swamp was released. It either sends a summoning to the top of the deck, or it removes the ninja from the team and makes it a standby ninja. Both of these outcomes mean you don't have to deal with it in the current battle, so I guess that's why it's good. Wind was a little bit light on support when it comes to generic support, but they did get a couple of things. Soccer and Eno Platoon is one of them. It wasn't exactly the most meta card out there, but if you were running a deck with Eno in it, then you could platoon it into Sakura Eno to give three support to your Sasuke and also have three mental power. And the fact that it could count as either Wind or Earth Chakra made it pretty good for mental power decks. Koyuki Kazahana was a client released for the set that made it so your opponent could only win two battle rewards a turn if you had Coronation Ceremony in play. Coronation Ceremony being a mission card you could use with any client you want, which just lowers the entrance cost of all ninjas in your hand by one turn. This didn't see a lot of meta play, but I find it interesting as a stall strategy. Now, if you want a meta client, then Emmy is definitely the way to go. Emmy is definitely one of the most popular clients in the game because you could use her to hold back one of your opponent's male ninjas. And keep in mind, no sexism or anything, most of the meta cards in the game at this point are male. And even if they aren't, if your opponent has a single male ninja in one of their teams, you play Emmy. That ninja can't be sent out to battle, so everybody in their team also can't be sent out to battle. It's basically a client version of Caged Bird, and it is fantastic. The last win card we'll look at today is Unfading Affection. It basically makes it so that neither player can remove a ninja that's already been in play from play, or move them to a different team or make them a standby ninja. This was just a counter to powerful jutsu like Toad Mouth Trap or uh, Trigram Divination Seal, Sukuyomi, Giant Water Vortex, the list really goes on. Despite Earth getting the most anti-meta stuff, Wind arguably got the best with Unfading Affection. And finally, we hit my element of water. This Kabuto lived true to his character by being an absolutely annoying card that nobody ever wanted to see, ever. If he's your head ninja, then the head ninja battling against him uses their injured stats, which most of the time would completely decimate a ninja. It would make them much weaker than Kabuto. So even though this Kabuto was only a rare, he was pretty highly sought after, because if you could throw two of these in your deck, then you could win a lot of battles, especially if you had a Rochimaru in the back. This was a very, very powerful card. Most people did stubbornly cling to their Kabuto Covert Ops Secret Rare, but I think that might have been a little bit of rarity bias because the new Kabuto was extremely good. Forcing your opponent to play around how weak their ninjas are going to be in injured status, is, it's so good. It's such great card design on Bondi's part. Bargaining Chip let each player move one of the ninjas from their discard pile to their hand. The idea here being that, again, since it's your turn, you'll get more out of the card than your opponent will. This card also sort of fed off of the people who are still using Cop Naruto, because if you did happen to get rid of a Brokage or something really important, then you could use Bargaining Chip to put it back in your hands. Sign of Conspiracy saw play, but probably not in the way you're expecting. Obviously it saw some play in Sound 4 decks, because you could use this to almost immediately gimp your opponent by taking one of their Genin. And keep in mind, you're not getting rid of your opponent's ninjas because you genuinely want to have them on your field. You want to use them as meat blockers, or you want to get rid of your opponent's back row ninja. Honestly, just having one of these timers on one of your opponent's ninjas will make them play differently. 
I know this video is nearly an hour long, but we have to talk about this. The set is so wild. How on earth did they release such a huge and varied set after such a broken set that seemed to nearly destroy the game? Keep in mind too that the creators of the Naruto card game probably thought that the game was just about over at this point. That's laughable to think nowadays, of course, because we have the hindsight of knowing that the Naruto card game would go on to release 29 sets during its life. In fact, there was even a 30th set created and released by fans a couple of years ago, which expands on the game even more with new card types and some pretty fantastic looking cards. Back then though, even juggernauts like Dragon Ball Z had card games that failed because they couldn't compete with other card games that were released at the time. So you can't really blame Bondi for thinking that the card game could be at its end. But what made the set such a lifesaver to the game is its commitment to giving other colors win conditions. Win conditions is something that absolutely does not get talked about enough when people are talking about card games, but is absolutely vital to understanding if you want to become good at them. The easiest way I could talk about win conditions is imagine each duel that you and your opponent has is a race. At this point, there will be two main moves you and your opponent are making. Aggressive, or aggro moves as they're called, will put pressure on your opponent and push you towards the finish line. Control moves, on the other hand, are the exact opposite, where you relieve some of the pressure off of your opponent's side of the board by taking advantages away from them. It also involves putting up roadblocks for your opponent to make it more difficult for them to develop their side of the board. A win condition is a card or set of cards that puts a huge gap between you and your opponent and makes it very difficult for them to be in a winning position. Aggro players will do this by playing a card that is so powerful if your opponent cannot deal with it immediately they're going to lose the game. Control players on the other hand do it by playing cards that either take away huge pieces of their opponent's side of the board or render any advantages they had meaningless. In some rare cases, a win condition can also involve both sides of the field being affected equally, you moderately gaining an aggressive advantage while also moderately controlling your opponent's side of the field. The advantage you gain or the advantage your opponent loses isn't necessarily huge, but the distance between the two of you is still pretty big and it's still going to put you in a game-winning position. Win conditional cards can come in two flavors. Chidori is an excellent example of a deck-based win condition. Deck-based win conditions are cards that, if allowed to resolve, will put you in a game-winning position. Chidori, for example, if allowed to properly resolve against one of your opponent's full teams of three ninjas, even if it's the three weakest ninjas in their deck, will give you a huge advantage. Every ninja on the field represents one turn, so if you can take out three of your opponent's ninjas, again, even if it's the three weakest ninjas in their entire deck, will take three turns away from your opponent. This is a huge amount of distance for your opponent to overcome, and if it's against an even stronger ninja, the distance is just going to get even worse. The other type of win condition is the situational win condition, where a card doesn't actually become a win condition until you see your opponent's board state or deck type. Suzume, for example, isn't normally a win condition on her own, even though she is a really good card. She can be a bit of a roadblock, sure, but she doesn't put up any kind of huge restriction on your opponent, and she also doesn't take anything huge from your opponent's side of the field. But if your opponent gains an early advantage in power and you just can't deal with it, then Suzume becomes a win condition because she takes away your opponent's ability to push into you. Now when you play Suzume, your opponent's huge 20-powered Sasuke-led team just is useless because they can't beat mental power and you have mental power. It also doesn't have some kind of upkeep cost, so while this is on the field, your opponent just can't win the game against you until they figure out a way to deal with her. All of this is important to understanding why Fire had such a huge advantage up to this point and why the other elements became a bit better in this set. Look at a card like the 4th Okage. I think we can all agree that this is an amazing card. It's a 5-3-6-5 that can hit himself for 1 damage to heal all of your ninjas at the beginning of the turn. As powerful as this effect is, it's not actually a win condition. You could never build a deck around this to make it a win condition, and situationally it could be extremely good, but it's probably not going to win you any games. You look at it in conjunction with a card like Disaster of the Nine-Tailed Fox Spirit, and you think, oh look, well there's a win condition. I'll deal one damage to everything on the board, and then I'll use the fourth Okage's effect to heal everybody on my side of the field up. That way, I don't actually suffer the negative effects. 
Bandai thought about this too, so there are some annoyances to actually making this effect happen. First of all, it's slow, because you have to have the fourth Hokage in play, and then you have to play Disaster of the Nine-Tailed Fox Spirit, and then at the beginning of your next turn is when you can actually heal the ninjas. There's no way to make both of these things happen at the same time because of the fourth Hokage's timing. It has to be at the beginning of your turn, and that can't happen until after you play the Nine-Tailed Fox Spirit if you're planning on pulling this move off. Even if you did do that, the fourth Hokage would inevitably kill itself with its own effect, meaning that you don't actually get the fourth Hokage after doing this combo. Hopefully you could see the problem. Even though the other elements were being given good cards at the time, they weren't actually being given anything they can build a deck into, otherwise known as a win condition. Fire has cards like Kakashi, which is an amazing deck-based win condition, because it puts a timer on your opponent. Whether they block you or not, you're going to gain battle rewards, so you're eventually going to win the game every single time you attack, even if your opponent is blocking you every single time. In addition to this, they also have amazing situational win conditions in the form of cards like 8 Trigrams. So even if your opponent does manage to get their win condition off, you can delete their win condition by just playing a single card, and then your win condition is even more powerful as a result. But with the advent of Dream Legacy, we were finally seeing a push towards giving the other elements win conditions. Toad Flame Bombs, while ironically still being fire, does give Lightning decks an amazing win condition, pretty much in the same way that Sasuke has. If you pull it off correctly, three ninjas can be gone, regardless of how powerful they are, and that's pretty much what you need to win the game. This is something you can build a deck around that will consistently win you games. Single target removal like Coiling Around, for example, were great for filling in that hole of situational win conditions that other elements didn't have. Now if your opponent's win condition does hit the board, you have some way to answer it so that your win condition can be more effective, just like Fire has. I'm not going to say this was perfect, Fire still stood as the strongest element among the elements, and it was just getting stronger and stronger, but Bondi was finally giving a reason to play other elements, in the form of win conditions. And as you'll see in the next video, which hopefully won't take 10 more months to make, what should have been the dying breath of the Naruto CCG turned into a second wind that would last for 24 more sets. I'll see you next time for Eternal Rivalry.